Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Churchill Club. My name is Karen Tucker, and I'm the CEO at the Churchill Club. Really happy to have Dana Boyd with us this evening, and we definitely have a treat in store for us. Uh, before we bring Dana up, I want to make a couple of announcements, including an introduction to Churchill Club in case we have some new guests in the audience who are less familiar with us. We are a nonprofit, which means, of course, that we exist for the purpose of benefiting the public. And our mission is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And our, we definitely take that very seriously with the programs that we choose. We present 30 or 40 events every year with the idea that it is important to talk about what's new next, not widely discussed already, in terms of the opportunities and the trends that technology is enabling in the world around us at a very rapid pace. So the people who come here and talk are the brightest thinkers and visionaries from education to transportation, healthcare to malware, drones, phones, just about anything that technology touches is fair game for a Churchill program. Uh, as long as the conversation is really fresh and valuable. And we also care a lot about topics like leadership and mentorship and collaboration and creativity, things that will always be important. They will never go out of style. So the idea is to create high quality opportunities for you to connect with one another who have common ground interests and with fresh ideas. If you're not on our mailing list, you can uh, ask the, the people at the registration desk when you leave or give me your contact information and I'll make sure that we include you from now on. And if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club. There are other Twitter codes in the program, including Dana's. Uh, there is a change. The Microsoft handle is Microsoft SV, as in Silicon Valley. And finally, before Dana comes up, Let's thank Microsoft for hosting us tonight. We really appreciate it. So Dana Boyd is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, and she is also a research assistant professor in media, culture, and communication at New York University. And she's a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And now she is also the founder and president of what she calls a think-slash-do tank called the Data and Society Research Institute. And her research examines the intersection between society and technology, and particularly she's focused lately on research questions related to big data, privacy, and uh, publicity, and teen culture which is largely what we'll talk about tonight. Her 2014 book is called It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens. It has received widespread praise from scholars, parents, journalists. Do pick it up. I'm sure you will want to after the conversation tonight if you haven't done so already. So Dana is going to speak with us for a short while, and then she is going to open up to a dialogue with you. So please be thinking of your questions as we go along. And this will be videotaped tonight, and so what that means is please do wait until you have the microphone in your hand to speak, because that way we'll make sure that the video is of high quality also. So please welcome Dana Boyd. Good evening. It's an absolute delight to be here. Um, and actually, I should say to invite you into Microsoft um, in sort of fun ways. I love coming out to this campus. Um, and I'm always excited to see different folks here. So the, what I'm going to talk with you about tonight is about my book. Um, it's about the book called It's Complicated. I'm going to give you a way of thinking about how I went about my research and what the sort of bigger picture is. And then we're going to hopefully go into conversation. Um, this is where I'm going to learn all of the crazy things that you all are interested in. So I was among uh, one of the first groups of young people who really grew up online. And for me, I thought of the internet as my saving grace. Um, it was the thing that allowed me to understand that the world was much bigger than the small town that I grew up in, in Pennsylvania. And I loved it. I loved the late night hours that I spent talking to strangers in an era before we thought that might be a bad thing. Um, and indeed, I actually was exposed to so many great um, opportunities and interactions, um, had my eyes opened in really critical ways. 
This was during the first Iraq war, and I spent a lot of time talking to um, young men, primarily, who were uh, uh, working in Iraq, who were fighting in Iraq. Um, and as somebody who intended to go into the military, this was extraordinarily informative, where I got to learn geopolitics from a fundamentally different angle. Um, and as a queer youth trying to figure out my own identity and figure out how I related to other people, I spent all this time talking, in particular, to um, various people who were struggling with their own identity. And I think, I think back to this one conversation that I had uh, with a transgender woman who allowed me to ask all sorts of inappropriate questions that only a 15-year-old is allowed to ask, um, who helped me really understand gender and sexuality in a really critical way. And I say this because this really shaped my understanding of what I thought technology was about. I thought it was this amazing transformative thing. It allowed me to get beyond my you know, home turf. It allowed me to see and interact with people who weren't like the people that I knew at school, and I loved it. So I went to school to study computer science. I figured I'd build the systems that I was so deeply passionate about, and I did um, for a while. In fact, my first stint out here in Silicon Valley was working for Macromedia back in the day as the first Unix engineer, which is ironic on so many levels. Um, and I, you know, it was an amazing uh, opportunity to be here. Um, and so I really built these systems, but I kept coming back to these questions of, what did people do with these technologies that we put out there? Um, through a very circuitous path, I ended up um, in grad school out at Berkeley. Um, and I ended up working with an amazing mentor, a man by the name of Peter Lyman, um, who was um, really starting to uh, ask questions about young people. And he asked me if I would be interested in studying them. Now, I should say at this point, I was studying um, the rise of a different phenomenon. I was studying the rise of something that I called social network sites um, that you've heard in different terms and different uh, ideas. And part of it is I was studying a service called Friendster. Some of you might remember this from back in the day. Um, and mind you, I started looking at Friendster in 2002, December of 2002, to give you a sense. The first Village Voice article, which was the first news article covering Friendster, occurred in June of 2003. So I was tracking this phenomenon at a very early level. And the reason why is that the adopters of Friendster were the same adopters you would see of most major social technologies in that era, self-identified geeks, freaks, and queers. And as all three, it was perfect, right? It was, this was awesome. Um, so I was really tracking and trying to make sense of it. And I was writing about it and what I was seeing on um, my website. This was before blog meant anything. Um, and this site, which had forward and backward buttons and a little calendar, um, was by and large read by about four people, because um, uh, I started it in 1997. But all of a sudden, me tracking these different things, these different social network practices, uh, resulted in a blow up, and suddenly people were paying attention to it. So I was doing that, and my advisor comes to me and is like, you know, um, would you be interested in, in looking at youth culture? And I was like, yeah, I think I need a break from this whole social network site thing. Like, I think that I need to pause from it. That'd be great. I'll go back. I'll look at um, Zanga and LiveJournal and AOL Instant Messenger, which were the things um, at the time. Uh, and I was like, great. And of course, by the time we finished negotiating this out, and I was tracking a site called MySpace emerge, you know, on this other project. I was in the thick of things, right? Teenagers had started jumping onto MySpace, and I ended up at ground zero of these two different trends. Um, and it was a really fantastic opportunity. For anybody who has an anthropological training, you know that the number one goal for an anthropologist when they go into a field is to be able to watch a full life cycle, right? A full cycle of whatever that is that they're studying which is one of the reasons why, in a traditional sense, we often talk about going into the field for a year, thinking about all of the, the cycles of the year. I ended up being in this great position to watch the rise and fall of MySpace, and the rise, and we can discuss the state of Facebook. Um, and that was sort of the, the um, flow that I ended up watching this, uh, this project on. Now, when I went in to look at all of what was going on, I assumed that this technology was going to be as transformative for everyday youth as it was for me. And I was excited that there were so many people, so many young people, suddenly using social technologies. I had these like beautiful, starry-eyed dreams of what would happen when it went mainstream. And I was startled to find out that that was not how this was playing out. Right? When it went mainstream, it meant that mainstream people came to the technology and used it in mainstream ways. And so I had to spend a lot of time untangling and decoding that and seeing what that looked like. Um, and as I embarked on this project, I was having a field day, um, just trying to make sense of things that were going on, mostly outside of the visibility of any media, for which I was really grateful. And then the media hit, right? The media decided to start covering young people and their use of technology. And as they do, the 
the news stories typically were absolutely fearful, right? These ways in which, oh my gosh, kids these days, right? And you can, you can think about all of the different epitaphs that came from that. The most notable, of course, was um, the sexual predation conversation that emerged around MySpace um, at the time. And so I started on this project to try to then untangle these narratives, these media-oriented, parent-oriented narratives, because they weren't gelling with what I was seeing on the ground. And so I ended up doing um, what, and it's, it's a decade worth of field work at this point, um, and working with a ton of different collaborators who brought on different methodological approaches so that I worked with people who were more quantitative in nature, really building out a statistical understanding. Now, of course, I was doing this for a dissertation. Um, and if, if any of you have ever written or read a dissertation, um, you know how painful that text is, right? Um, the very theoretical, the very very unreadable, the very things you don't want to read. Um, at the same time, I kept having to respond to these very public conversations. And so I actually ended up producing this book because I wanted to respond to the public conversations. And so the book is really written to speak to the public. And you know, sometimes I get a little academic. Um, but part of it is, is that I organized the book around a lot of the major tropes that we kept hearing about young people. So there's a chapter that goes into the questions of bullying, a chapter that goes into the questions of predation, uh, one that talks about whether or not the internet is really a great equalizer, one that talks about digital natives, one that talks about questions of addiction, one that talks about um, identity, a bunch of these different things. And I'm saying this because we can go into any of those strands as they interest you. Um, but the overarching story um, that I kept realizing as I was going on this thing was that, you know, everybody kept saying, like these adults kept saying to me, kids, like, you know, it's all the technology, it draws them in, you know, why can't they do what we did when we were kids? Why don't they just go out and socialize with their friends? And so I started asking young people about this. And what I kept getting as a response overwhelmingly was, I would much rather get together with my friends in person note without parental surveillance, um, but I'm not allowed to. And then they'd list off all of the reasons as to why it had become structurally impossible. And I became really fascinated by this. So I started looking into what was happening. And I realized that a lot has changed about American society in the last 30 years that we don't account for, that we don't think about. So you know, think about that practice that was so common in middle and upper class American society um, for the better part of the middle um, uh, component of the 20th century, which was really get on your bike, be home by dinner or dark, or some narrative like this. You saw this as being extraordinarily commonplace throughout this country um, for a very long time. Um, and you go back further, and there's you know, it's a different set of dynamics. I will never forget. Um, there's beautiful video of um, teenagers uh, in the 1920s complaining that the, um, the public spaces that they could gather in closed at 11 p.m. and they had to go home then, right? It's just really fascinating to think about now. Um, so I was sort of intrigued by this and I started thinking about what had changed, right? In the 1970s, we started a whole narrative that was popularized by a lot of films that um, young people were dangerous, right? And part of it, of course, is a response to um, late 1960s, early 1970s conversations. And we were concerned as a society about the dangerous, roving, um, you know, demonoid child. And we, we didn't want our kids to become one of those. Um, and so we had, this was part of the conversation of moving away from the city into the suburbs. This played out in different ways. But it really wasn't so highly visible until late 1970s, early 1980s, when we started to see 24-7 news media. And what 24-7 news media brought us was this notion that like terrible things will happen to kids everywhere, and therefore in your backyard, and you needed to watch out for your child. Um, and we switched to this just afraid um, of young people to a dichotomous relationship in the 80s of being both afraid of and afraid for our youth. And we responded to this in a whole slew of different ways. We implemented a whole set of uh, legal restrictions on young people, curfew laws, anti-loitering laws, um, anti-trespassing laws. We even put in technical interventions. Some of you may remember when 7-Eleven put in that horrible buzzy thing um, to try to keep young people out, depending on the kinds of auditory um, elements they had. As somebody who was older and could hear that, it was very annoying. Um, Public spaces that we would normally think where kids could gather were often verboten for young people. Parks, it was like it was a dangerous, dangerous space. You couldn't go into public parks. That really emerged in the 80s. But even the kinds of more privatized spaces, right? The 1980s and 90s were all about um, the mall as a space, right? 
By the late 1990s, um, young people couldn't gather in groups of greater than three without an adult present in many uh, malls in this country. So we started seeing these restrictions that emerged um, through these environments. But those restrictions didn't just stay there. They stayed in terms of how they shaped how we thought about even home life. So um, some of you who may have grown up um, in the 80s or before may have heard the term latchkey kids, um, which was a really common notion in the US. Um, I certainly grew up with it. For those who missed it, the notion of a latchkey kid was that you got on the school bus um, after school where you went straight home, um, you know, possibly stopping off at your friend's house, um, and you proceeded to have a healthy snack Lucky Charms. Um, and then you, you went on to do your homework or watch TV. Um, you know, and you had this sort of negotiation until your parents got home, in which you, know, you were the good child and you had been all doing well. Well, the narrative that emerged in the 80s was that this was terrible for youth, right? That youth who were latchkey kids were at greater risk for all sorts of things and fret, 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 fret. So it prompted particularly middle upper class American society to respond by creating all sorts of infrastructure um, that would make certain that young people were always um, in activities or structured, activi uh, structured um, situations. So now it is really commonplace, especially in upper middle class American society, for young people to be in structured activities from 6.30 or 7 a.m. through dinner and beyond. Right? And the, the question there is, where is their free time? Where is their flex time? Where do they get to just socialize with their friends? There were a couple of places, even in those schedules, where you had that time. The most notable was the ability to um, hang out with your friends in the process of getting to and from school. Um, Prior to the, uh, the 1980s, we could assume that 80 plus percent of American youth were either, um, either went to school by a school bus or went to school by walking, right? We are now well under 40 percent of that. Um, and the reason, what that does is it shapes how they spend their time. And part of it, of course, was we were afraid of the school bus. Um, we were afraid of it, particularly around narratives of bullying. And we, for, we forbid young people from going to school that way, so we started driving them. Um, school activities magnified the driving culture in particular ways. Um, but what this did is it eliminated about an hour at either end of the school day where young people would just mess around, right? They would, you know, they'd get to the school bus stop. Who knows what they'd do? They'd mess around with each other on the bus. But the buses would be there to get to the school early, so they'd you know, hang out in their lockers. You know, and for a lot of young people, this slowly disappeared. Another really significant factor that changed was around um, really valuable and understood um, notions of things like school choice, such that historically you could assume that your closest friends were probably within a five mile radius, probably even less, and it was viable to bike to them. Um, as uh, we had school choice and privatization and charter schools and a variety of other um, you know, educational interventions, what we started to see is that young people didn't necessarily live geographically close to their dearest friends. So even the possibility of getting to them via bike became really limited. Um, they relied on their parents to get access to it, right? And that became a problem, especially if parents work and all the different day time structures and whatnot. Um, of course, there used to be a rite of passage that at 16 you would get a car and this would be awesome. Um, and of course, there's the economic elements of uh, driving culture that radically shifted. But there's also a set of legislative interventions that occurred um, that did stuff like saying that you can't be driving other kids around. Right? And think about it, if you're a 16-year-old kid, part of the reason to get your license is so you can hang out with other kids. Right? So it wasn't just the sort of fun, it, the whole point of freedom had dissipated. And we started seeing this be a source of tension and frustration. Um, so these are some of the factors, and I, there's actually a bunch of other factors, but they all start to lead into this dynamic where young people had lost the right to roam, lost the space of total freedom, and it really varies across the country in different ways, but it becomes a collective trend and then along comes technology, right? And what technology does for many young people is that it solves, a, it creates a relief valve. It gives them an opportunity where they know they can get together with their friends. Because there's another layer to this, which is that it's a collective action problem. You may have the freedom as a particular child to go and do whatever you want, but if your friends don't, then what's the point, right? And so, you know, it used to be, of course, you would sneak out the one kid that couldn't get together. But when the majority of them couldn't, why sneak out? It becomes hard. Why not then turn to technology? Technology ends up solving a couple of different issues. Not only is it a lot easier to get access to the technology than it is to sneak out and find a physical place that you can gather in, um, but it also allows for asynchronous interactions, 
right? The ability to have a conversation that's spread over time or really mobile or dealing with all these navigation issues. Um, and you can have them even when you're in really structured situations. And so you see a lot of interstitial spacing, timing. Um, so which means that like between activities where you have those moments where you're in the back seat and your parents are driving you somewhere and you're texting with somebody because that's the way to communicate in, in the time and in the flow. All right, so then how do we understand a lot of these social media? Right, young people in the United States actually interacted with these technologies fundamentally different than places, places around the world. And it has to do with these geographic restrictions. The only places in the world that do an amazing job of competing with the US for fear mongering are the UK and Australia. So if you've got friends there, like they're doing a great job, like just full on competing with us on that one. Um, but we create this environment. And so for a while in the early 2000s, this is an extraordinarily freeing space. Young people are using it. They're having fun. They're having a field day. And they're leaving all sorts of highly visible traces that, by and large, adults are not paying attention to. Right? And then they start to. Right? And they start to, and this is where anxiety and fear, the same dynamics, the same concerns that we have had about physical spaces, start to shape the technologies themselves. Right? And we start to see um, a cycle of things that we've seen historically about other spaces, other public spaces, shape our understanding and interpretation of these technologies. And that's where it's like, you know, again, we'll, we can go into any of the vectors you want. I'm going to drive down on one particular vector. I'm going to drive down on this question of privacy. I'm going to drive down on it because it's the thing that was most um, significantly changed over the decade in which I actually did this work. And at the beginning of things, as I mentioned, we can rely on the fact that young people would put things up there and nobody was paying attention, so it was no big deal. Right now, there's this question of, like, kids these days, do they not care about privacy? Why would they share so much online, right? Um, and there's, you know, a different political stances of, like, privacy must be dead. Kids must not care about privacy, which is often used to justify um, um, collecting large amounts of their data. My young people, when you talk to them, care deeply about privacy. But in my research, I started to realize that their experiences and how they navigate privacy complicate our very understandings of what is privacy or how we negotiate it. So I'm going to start with the sort of um, how we even define privacy. Usually in a technical sense and often in a legal sense, we define privacy as the control of the flow of information. If you are a geek, you know that this is something like an access control list, right? Ways of really systematically thinking about controlling it as a mechanism. Um, but this is not actually how people experience privacy. How they experience privacy violations when things don't feel right, when they feel like somebody responded in a way that they shouldn't, and they get all flipped out about it. And a lot of technologists would be like, well, it was public. I don't care. You wrote it eight years ago. It was public. Shouldn't you know that it's public? And they're like, no. And so I started to realize that privacy for a lot of people is not about the control of the flow of information, but of the control of a social situation. And to control a social situation really means understanding what's going on, understanding what's at stake, figuring out the context, understanding the interpretation, dealing with it holistically. But this is actually extremely difficult. Obviously, as I'm talking around this, this is not a precise, easy to define, easy to implement kind of definition. And in fact, it actually rests on three key pillars that we often struggle with. The first is the ability to have agency or power. Right? Do you have the ability to assert control? Right? And for many teenagers, no matter what the settings of a particular service do, all it takes is for mom to look over the shoulder, right? and you lose a sense of control. So how do you regain control when you assume a state of constant surveillance? Right? That's really tricky. The second key issue has to do with context. How do you learn to interpret a particular context? How do you make sense of the context in which you are in? Now, part of it is, of course, we are exposed to context all the time. We learn to navigate them through uh, a maturation process, right? All of you have been exposed to situations where you are attending a lecture. You have learned that the, your responsibility is to sit in the seat and pretend like you're paying attention to me and not along, right? This is what we've learned to do. Any one of you could dance on that table, right? It'd be fun. I'd enjoy it. And if we had a, if we had a two-year-old in here, they'd totally be making a mess out of all of this, right? You've learned this context. But the thing is, is that those online worlds, they change the rules of what the context is. Do we understand it? How do we deal with temporal flow? How do we deal with, like, things that shift? Do we get all of the people that are a part of it? It's a process of learning. And it's something that's really challenging to navigate on a regular basis.
The third key thing that becomes really critical to controlling a social situation is the ability to have the skills to navigate that situation. Right now, often we talk about this in terms of the technical skills, right? Do you know how to manipulate the particular settings on a service, right? And that is one set of skills, but often not the most valuable. Most of the really valuable skills are really people skills, right? Do you know how to navigate the people that are around you? Do you know who to trust, who, to, who will respect you, how they will respond to you, what's going on? One example of this is think back to your middle school years or perhaps your current workforce and think about that one person who you know if you tell them anything, they're gonna spread it like wildfire, right? Especially the things you tell them not to tell anybody. Right? And the first time you learned this, it was really embarrassing and frustrating and you were just like, why did you tell everybody? But then you realized that when you wanted something to be spread, you just told them, right? Don't tell anybody, and you watched, right? And it would go in all sorts of different ways. This is a social skill. This is some of the things we learn about what it means to trust and respect and understand boundaries. It is also part of how we navigate a lot of online environments. Like, how do we understand who is really trustworthy, what's going to happen? Now, what's critical, of course, is that not all of our interpretations of social situations are accurate. Right? We mess up. We mess up all the time. Um, and we learn from it in different ways, but sometimes not as visible as what happens online. And that's what makes this complicated in particular ways. Now, teenagers, as I watched them, became more and more sophisticated with the experimentation that they would do in their efforts to achieve privacy. They would do all sorts of fun things, both technical um, in sense and really social. So I'm gonna give you two esoteric technical examples that are really illustrative of um, the kinds of uh, practices you might see and one much more common practice. I'll start um, with a story of a, a young woman that I met in DC who, she was frustrated because people love to bring up the past to start drama. By the past, she meant about a month ago, right? So we're working with a constrained sense. Um, and she was frustrated. Facebook was the top tool at the time. Everybody was on Facebook. But she just did not want that stuff sticking around because she was annoyed. Right? So she went in and she decided one day she would just delete all of the content, all of her status updates, all of her pictures, everything. Not only that, everything that anybody left for her. Then she went around and she posted pictures. She left comments. She had a field day. The next day she logged in and she deleted all of that. Right? And then the next day, and then she would add more things and then delete all of that. She engaged in a practice that she referred to as white walling. Um, it was a time when the wall meant something, right? And it was about keeping it stark white in the, in the Facebook aesthetic. Um, and it was a really interesting approach because she was just trying to keep it as ephemeral as possible. And I said to her, well, anybody could screen grab it or copy it, you know, and it could bring it back. And she's like, yeah, yeah, but that would just be weird, right? And so what she was really clearly indicating is that it was about the ways in which the technology hit the social. If you thought ahead of time of saving something that she had posted, that meant you were really creepy, right? That meant you were really problematic. It was your issue. It wasn't about the technology. Versus you going back and seeing something and bringing it up, that was about the technology, right? Now, we can laugh at this. It's a pretty entertaining way of going about things until you think about Snapchat, right? What is Snapchat? It's about making things ephemeral. Most people get all, uh, you know, panties in a bunch thinking that this is about sexualized images. Most teenagers are just like, dude, it's just not that interesting for this to stick around, right? Taken out of context, it's really problematic. And this is one of the reasons why they don't flip out about whether or not the technology really allows it to be um, removed or not. Whether or not you can screen grab it using a third phone. They're just like, yeah, of course, you can get over that. That's all part of it. But the whole point is we're signaling this is not meant to stick around. And so therefore, you are violating a social norm when you do things to make it stick around. We've shifted the burden, we've shifted the assumption. And part of it has to do with the fact that if you think about our interactions, you know, if I'm sitting there having a conversation with Larry, our conversations are fundamentally private by default. Simply, even, even though he's a journalist, he has to choose what I say to publicize. And most of what I say just is not that interesting. Right? So he doesn't publicize it even though he's got a microphone to do that. Right? And so this is part of the negotiation of how do we deal with this on an everyday basis. Online, the defaults have become public by default, private through effort. Right? And sure enough, on things like you know, Facebook, people take a lot of attention to try to privatize certain things. And otherwise, who cares if you get to know what I had for breakfast? It's really not that interesting. Move on. Right? But this is why things like Snapchat, which change the rules, are really interesting. All right, so let me give you another sort of esoteric um, uh, geek approach, or so technical approach to this. Um, another woman I met in DC uh, was um, in foster care, which meant 
Um, she's a guardian of the state, which means the state is her guardian. Um, and for those who have not dealt with environments where kids are under state surveillance because of that relationship, um, it's very common for caseworkers to demand access to social media. Um, and this was something she was battling with all the time. Uh, and she was always, even though she had refused to um, friend her caseworker, she was forced to actually log into her Facebook account whenever she saw her caseworker. And she was fed up. Because the problem was, it wasn't what she posted that got her into trouble. It was what her friends posted. They inevitably posted something stupid, and she had to explain, and it caused all these problems. Because our identities and our reputations are not about ourselves. They're about how we are situated within a broader network. And she just didn't didn't want to have to constantly explain for her friends. So she went to delete her Facebook account. She was over it, right? Now, if you've never deleted your Facebook account, it's an amazing guilt-ridden process, right? All of these people will miss you, and they show you all these pictures, right? Like, you can't possibly leave. Don't do it, right? And it's just like guilt, 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 guilt. And they give you an out. They're like, you can deactivate your account, and you can always come back at any time. Now, the nice thing about deactivation is when you deactivate your account, you're not searchable. Nobody can leave a post uh, for you. They can't leave a message. They can't comment on any of your stuff. They can't see any of your stuff. They can only see it when you're logged in at the same time. So she got an idea. She deactivated her account. The next day, she logged in. She reactivated her account. She used it for three hours, and she deactivated it. Next day, she logged in. She reactivated her account, used it for a few hours, and deactivated it. The next day, da 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 da, da right? She basically engaged in something called the super logout, right? Making certain that if she wasn't around, you couldn't see her, period. So I say to her, so okay, you don't want your caseworker seeing things, and of course the nice thing is your caseworker can't search for you, you can sort of say you no longer have a Facebook account, but what happens when your caseworker logs in at the same time as you? And she's like, I thought of this, right? That's why I don't log in before 7 p.m., right? In her head, caseworkers log in during business hours. Probably true. Um, so she was working to control the situation by making certain that her caseworker and her were never logged in at the same time, and she could use it freely with her friends. Now, regardless of whether or not that works technically, what you see is an effort to really try to control the social situation in some meaningful sense. Now, these, of course, are two rarefied practices. But let me give you the most common practice. And this is something that changed significantly over the last decade in the United States as young teenagers learn to be political dissidents, um, unbeknownst to them, um, which is the process of thinking about how you hide in plain sight. So rather than trying to restrict access to content, which is always a problem if you assume parents are looking over your shoulders, how do you restrict access to meaning? Right? And I'll give this through the story of Carmen, because I love this story. It's so geeky. It's so perfect. Um, Carmen is um, uh, a young woman in, in um, uh, Massachusetts of Argentinian descent. She can rely on the fact that her mother does not know British cultural references, which becomes really important here. She loves that Facebook is a tool that she can use with her broader network. Um, she has both family members and friends on Facebook with her. And she code switches, which is to say that when she's talking to her extended family, she speaks in Spanish, even though she knows her friends understand a lot of Spanish. But they get that when she's talking in Spanish, she's talking to her family. Meanwhile, when she's talking to her friends, she talks in English. And everybody seems to get this except her mother, um, who feels the need to comment on anything that she posts which is unbelievably frustrating to Carmen. Um, so one day, she and her boyfriend have just broken up, and she wants to tell all of her friends that she's feeling pretty lousy. She wants their love, she wants their support, she wants their validation, but she knows that if she posts something depressive on her, po on her Facebook, her mother all thinks she's suicidal, right? It's become a problem before, and she just does not want to deal with that. Um, so she's trying to figure out how she can signal her friends what's up without necessarily um, telling, telling her mom. Now, she's a teenager trying to express her emotions, which means she's looking for the perfect song lyric, right? Song lyrics are the way you talk emotions. And she knows that her mother ha doesn't have any understanding of a film that she and her friends have most recently watched. So she puts up song lyrics from Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now, for those who do not know this very geeky reference, it is a song sung during the Monty Python skit, The Life of Brian, during the scene in which the key character is being crucified. There is nothing happy about this scene, even though the lyrics sound so positive. She posts this. Her mother immediately comments, it looks like you're having a great day. And her friends immediately text her. Right? It's a beautiful game of what I talk about as social steganography. Steganography being an old crypto term that basically means hiding, hiding in plain sight with a really sordid history that we won't go into. But I think it's a really interesting approach, because it's young people sort of figuring out ways of trying to communicate and layer the communication. 
Um, in, indeed, in Twitter, they actually even came up with a term for it, subtweeting. Um, now, subtweeting is often referred to not just encoded content, but often drama-filled encoded content. Um, and I would see this kind of stuff uh, all the time, where it's like, you know, these posts are like, oh my god, can you believe what she said? And it's like, uh, okay. And then, of course, it has retweets or follows or likes or anything. And like, oh, I know, she's such a bitch. And you're like, okay, who's she? What's going on here? What's happening? Right? And all of a sudden, you know, all the teenagers that are a part of that social world can totally decode it, right? They can tell me about the boy and the, and the fight and what happened Friday night and what was going on here. And I can't follow any of it. Right? And it's not just because I'm old, although I'm, teenagers love to tell me that I'm old. It's because of the fact that this kind of practice is about realizing that people are looking in and that you're going to play with it. Now, that playing with it also twists around in funny ways. Teenagers try to manipulate the systems um, that they're dealing with in light of their understanding of the systems. My favorite of this, again, when Facebook um, was sort of front and center of all of this, was that teenagers started to realize that the stuff they posted did not necessarily reach their friends. Now, for those of you who don't seem to realize this, Facebook doesn't show you everything your friends post. In fact, only about 40% of your friends see the stuff you post. Right? They do a lot of curatorial stuff depending on whether they think that that content is going to be uh, appreciated or not in order to make the, it a better experience to narrow down the content you see. But this was really frustrating to a lot of teenagers who wanted everything they said to be shared with everybody around them. So they decided, like, what was appearing to be at the top? What was always seeming to be there? And they got an idea. And I started seeing all of this great content that started out with things like, yo, what's up, Nike? I'm like, huh? And all of a sudden, I realized that teens thought that brand referencing brands would increase the likelihood that their content would appear uh, at the top of the feed. Now, whether or not they're accurate, I don't know. Facebook won't confirm or deny. Um, but it's a really intriguing moment. And of course, BuzzFeed articles that had nothing to do with anything, and they post it and up it go, right? And this was their way of messing with the system. And you start to realize how your understanding of the system, this is your understanding of the context. How can you work within it? How can you manipulate it? What can you do to achieve um, your sense of the social situation? Now, of course, this isn't the only tool that this would happen. Um, sometimes you just do it because it's funny, right? And teenage humor is just awesome on that level. Um, so I used to sit in you know, this one school, and I was sitting with this one boy, and I was watching him type these ridiculous messages through Gmail. Gmail uh, Google was one of the few services that was not banned in the school, so they emailed uh, via Gmail during the day. And I was like, what are you writing? And why are you, you know, whiting out the text so that people can't read it? What's going on? And I quickly realized that nothing is funnier than, from a 15-year-old boy logic than getting your friends to get diapers ads because of the things you send them, right? Which is realizing that the ads are somehow linked to the content. You might as well mess with it, right? It's like, all right, that's, that's one way of working with it. Right? It's this way of trying to navigate it. And it's those actions, those moments where they're trying to understand the situation around them, where you start to see how privacy and publicity get operationalized. Um, so this is sort of a lot of my fun. You know, is it perfect? No. They make a mess all the time. They mess up all the time. But part of it is they're teenagers, right? And they're navigating the space that they have access to, that space that is very much about technology, the space that gives them the opportunity to make sense of things. And they're living out and negotiating a social world that is very much networked. Now, I keep making comments about when Facebook was popular because in most of the teenagers that I talk to now, Facebook is not the passion play, which is to say that Facebook is not where they go because they want to engage with all their friends. It's where they go when they're running for student council and need to announce something. It's where they go when they get a, want to get a phone number about somebody. Their passion play has fragmented. Their passion play has fragmented in ways that actually are much more appropriate in a social environment. Um, for those of you who might work at Facebook, that is not all um, bad for Facebook because one of the biggest passion plays around it is Instagram. Right? That's one place. But we see these segmentations, Instagram, Vine, uh, Twitter, Tumblr, um, various social uh, chats, uh, what, um, uh, uh, Yik Yak, Whisper.io, it's all over the place right now. Right? And that's a really interesting moment because young people are looking and saying, I'm going to segment my worlds accordingly. And I think about this young woman that I met for whom, you know, Twitter was like the thing for her, for, like Instagram was her friends, Twitter was the thing for her obsession with One Direction. Right? Um, and that, the, it, what was interesting about this is that she had contextualized all of Twitter about One Direction, like obsessively. Right? And any of her friends were welcome to follow her, but they all thought she was kind of crazy. Like that obsession, not only was it passe, but it was really not their thing. Um, and so they were having none of it. But it was this interesting moment of saying, like, you know what? Sometimes we have these different worlds that we want to segment in really critical ways. Why do we have to shove them all together and try to navigate through them through a series of privacy settings? 
So we're back to an environment where it's all very fragmented. But that fragmentation has consequences. Consequences that, especially in Silicon Valley, we don't really think through. Um, my most notable around this has to do with the tension that has emerged um, between Vine and Instagram. Most likely, you're paying a lot more attention to Instagram than you are to Vine, even though those numbers are really significant. And the reason why is that the media is paying a lot more attention to Instagram. A lot of um, politicians are paying a lot more attention to Instagram. Uh, a lot of venture is paying a lot more attention to Instagram. It's become sort of the example of things. Obviously, it's buyout um, by is, Facebook is part of that story. But it's also that um, Vine is primarily used by black and Latino and low-income populations. And so if you are not in those worlds and you're not seeing it, you don't even realize just how darn popular this is. The reason I highlight this is that in my book, I, I talk about a different scenario of segmentation. The 2006 to 2007 school year where the battle between Facebook and MySpace got narrated very publicly in a very racist way. Um, and I say that because we do this over and over again. Social media is reproducing every aspect of social life. And we are a very segregated, very segmented society. And that plays out in our tools, and it plays out in how we treat them. And the reason that I was concerned about this is that back in that 2006 to 2007 school year, there were really critical ramifications. Colleges recruited on Facebook and not on MySpace. Military banned MySpace, but not Facebook. Guess who, whose officers were using it versus soldiers were using it, right? We had significant dynamics of who was paid attention to and who wasn't, whose norms were valued and who weren't. We do this over and over again with our technologies. And so as you start to see these technologies play out and be a part of your ecosystem, pay attention to also which technologies we don't give credit to or which populations within our own communities we recognize or don't recognize. And with that in mind, I'm going to let us go into any direction that you want. Um, and I know that there are microphones that everybody needs to listen to because there are cameras. Hi, camera. Um, so where, microphone number one, microphone number two, who wants me to go in what direction? This is the participation part. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Um, do you see these technologies as sort of the ultimate um, free market or the ultimate in democratization of communication. Um, I'm supposed to ask you to introduce your name and maybe... Uh, I'm Mike Shepard from Growth Point. Awesome. I definitely grew up in the 90, 90s period where we imagined that the internet would be amazingly democratizing. We imagined that everybody would get onto it and things would be fantastic. And as things are playing out, that is not the direction in which many major players want it to go. Um, and there's a really interesting fight brewing. Nowhere is that more clear than the net neutrality debates. Um, this question of what kind of internet, what kind of free opportunity we want. Um, in terms of people's everyday practices, I think part of it, as I referred to as some of the questions of structural inequality, have to do with the fact that we don't enter the table at an equal playing field. Even something so simple about how you get information in your world. Most people at this point get information through their networks. They, you know, whether we're talking at a social media level or an interpersonal level. Just think about what you see when you're on Twitter. That's very much shaped by the things that you, the people you've chosen to, to follow. Well, depending on the communities you're from, you're getting different kinds of information than others. Um, and I would argue that this has been highly polarizing. I am seeing this painfully right now um, because I, um, uh, with family in um, Israel, I've been following in gory detail what's happening um, in the Middle East. Um, and I have a lot of extended friends um, uh, and colleagues that are in Gaza or Palestinian by descent and in, in the United States. And I go back and forth between the different feeds and what they see, and they don't even see the same conversation. And even my partner, who has friends in um, both locations and is very connected to both because of the kinds of algorithms we've seen, is only seeing Facebook, or sorry, on Facebook is only seeing Israeli-related material. And that really concerns me. And so I say this because the democratization issue happens at multiple levels. It, has to, it happens about how we structure our system. Now, part of it also it has to do with how we constitute fairness. And fairness is something that we really need to grapple with, especially I'm going to do a moment to go into the big data world, because it becomes really, really critical here. Historically, we've had two competing notions of fairness in this country, equality and equity. Equality is the very, very dominant American notion that everybody is equal opportunity, it's a meritocracy, 
bureaucracy. If we let everybody into the door, they can do what they want. They can build off of it. Um, and this is something that we really promote. This is part of the American dream. Equity um, is a different notion. Equity basically says that people don't start off at the same point in the starting line, and we need to acknowledge systemic um, reasons for that. Um, and so, of course, this was at the core of the civil rights movement, um, and we thought, thought about things like affirmative action or other ways of addressing inequities that were at our very core. Um, in the 60s, we most, this was mostly declared communist. More recently, it's mostly declared socialist. And we pretty much pan any conversation that is about equity because we are living in a post-racial society, clearly. Um, now, of course, that's a very European notion and a very European approach to thinking about equity. But there's a third logic, a third logic that was core to capitalism and core to business that has become more pervasive in the cultural logic of this country. And that is a basic notion of fairness that is market driven. Now, think about this as something as simple as um, uh, your relationship with a frequent flyer mechanism, right? So, you know, let's say that you fly a lot more than I do, and so Delta wants to keep you as a customer. They think you're awesome. They give you all these perks. You don't pay $25 for your bag. You get amazing discounts. That's really awesome. You get the better seats. You get all the free food. Like, that's great. Okay? Um, and we think this is relatively fair within a market you know, ecology. Because you know what? Delta doesn't care if I go to US Air. It's whatever, I fly twice a year, no big deal. Um, him, on the other hand, we want to keep him around. Right? That's really important. So OK, um, that's relatively agreed upon as to how we um, construct our democracy here. What happens when we take that same logic and we use technology to take that same logic to other environments? Consider, for example, what's happening in Chicago um, as predictive policing has rolled out en masse through a lot of the technologies that we've used. We determine that there is, um, we need to deal with limited resources, law enforcement officers, so let's distribute them based on our mechanism of where we think they're needed most. Right? And as you can imagine, what that basically means is that we tend to distribute our law enforcement officers into environments that are more low income, more people of color, et cetera. Now, of course, law enforcement officers have certain incentives um, for them every month. They need to clear warrants. They need to do certain amounts of arrests. There's different kinds of things that play out. Guess where they're clearing warrants? Guess where they're doing arrests? Right? And these become a cycle. This becomes part of our logic of fairness. This doesn't just extend. It's also the way in which these moments um, are sort of intertwined, or the way that they've shifted over time. So I think about it in terms of Martha Poon's work on um, FICO scoring. For those who don't know the history of FICO, um, the idea of scoring in the United States was in order to provide um, populations who could not otherwise get access to credit um, a way of actually fairly being determined whether or not they were worthy of credit. It was mostly for women um, in an environment where they didn't have trusted networks, and it was seen as an amazing democratizing tool. And yet, that's not how it ended up playing out, right? We moved scoring to a whole different mechanism over the years, and we say, okay, you know, we'll have this environment where you've got a greater score than I do, so the result of which is that I'm going to pay a greater burden um, of, you know, of cost um, to a financial service because, again, you know, it's like I'm a higher risk, so I should pay that, um, that bear that greater cost. It's a very economic-driven notion. But that's, if that ended there, we could have a conversation about fairness that's there. But we've moved it with technology a little bit further. We've done it in a, in a more systematic way because we can actually use a lot of analytics to take lower and lower risks and to figure out how to deal with po populations at a greater level. The reality is, is that as a bank, they want you. They don't just want you because you've got the greater score, but you actually hold up a whole set of reputational mechanisms for them that become really important when they think about the distribution of their risk, when they think about um, the way in which their reputation stands up to their creditors in different ways. Um, and so they don't, re they want to do anything possible to compete, or to, to um, compete with their competitors to keep you. And so they go lower and lower in how much profit they make off of you. Me, on the other hand, they don't really like me. They don't really want me. I'm a high risk. But while I'm here, while I'm taking money from them, they might as well make all of their profit off of me. And that's where we started to see these mechanisms. So that, the reason I bring this up is that what happens is not whether or not technology is the democratizer. It's how we understand our democracy and how we use the technology to pursue those different ends. And I would argue that we are using them predominantly per, to pursue a very particular market logic that has huge ramifications for a lot of our societal infrastructure and that we're not actually accounting for it and that we're par bearing the burden unequally and we are actually part of the structural inequality uh, battles long term. And that's something I am deeply worried about and trying to figure out. Long-winded answer, but hopefully useful. Uh, 
So who has the mic? There's a, well, there's a mic over there. Uh, you have the mic. Go for it. Sean? Kalpesh Kapadia, Trust Factors. You, you talked about the physical restriction that were placed uh, in the 90s and... Uh, uh, you know, I recently observed that car companies are really worried that teenagers are not going out at, as soon as they turn 16 to get a driver license, but they are now getting a smartphone. So that's more important than getting a license. No, not really, but okay. That's uh, the observation. Sure. Okay. We'll and, uh, you know, once you start seeing restrictions on smartphone usage, because that's the medium through which people are getting onto their, you know, virtual world. What, what, what is the reaction going to be from it? Uh, assuming that my hypothesis is correct. Right. Young people want to get together with their friends in person without parental surveillance. Overwhelmingly, if they're given the opportunity to, they do so all the time. It used to be that a driver's license was a freeing thing, right? It was amazing. You could get out. You could sit with your friends. That's not the case. That's what's affecting this, right? Now, driving is a burden. All of us know that. Like, have you seen that highway lately? What the heck is that, right? Like, there's nothing fun about it at this point with that going on, right? And so we have this moment where young people are like, I don't have freedom, both because my parents will restrict me. They don't want me on that highway. I can't see my friends. I can't go anywhere with my friends. It's like, why deal with this? It's expensive, and I might as well get my parents to drive me. The smartphone is obviously the thing that connects them. Um, and it gives them the opportunity to hang out, um, you know, sort of, it's a trade-off, right? They still prefer that face-to-face -face environment. And it's um, the majority of young people, at least. Um, but the, f the phone is great. Um, now, the phone has a lot of restrictions. Um, sometimes it's surveillance mechanisms, not nearly as surveilled as um, uh, the computers were in many ways. Uh, but, you know, still there. There's certainly restrictions about what times they're allowed to use it in different ways. And that becomes an issue when they sneak and find ways around it. Um, but it's still the more freeing device. It's more the more freeing thing. The question for me is how do we get to an environment where it's not just a constant battle with young people to constantly restrict all of their freedom of mobility? And the reason I think it's also important is we tout freedom as the most important value in American society. Why do we not encourage young people to have freedom and to treat it with a level of responsibility? That seems politically at odds to our long-term political strategies, right? Uh, but yet, we do it. Um, and so I'm more concerned about what does it take to create more of those freedoms? We can continue this battleground, and we probably will given the current political state. Um, but I think it has huge ramifications and costs. Some of those costs um, I get to bear as, um, in, at, at a university. Nothing is more fun than a bunch of 18-year-olds who have never had freedom showing up at your college campus, right? Like, that's just great. Um, and it's really costly, <laughs> both to you at you know, $40,000 a year or whatever it is these days, um, but also to those young people who have no training wheels of how to explore a sense of freedom. One of the big challenges for the, you, those of you who are parents, you have this amazing responsibility to transition your children from a state of true vulnerability, you know, the cute little cuddly version of it, um, to a state of serious independence. And it is a hard transition. But if you don't do that transition when they're in, their, in your home, if you don't help them have that kind of freedom, they can often crash and burn in really ugly ways when they've left your household. So part of it is I want to say take responsibility back give them that kind of freedom, let them out further and further. Of course you pull them back when things go wrong. Of course you, you, you navigate it within your own household values. But that freedom is really, really critical. And it's not just about technological freedom, it's about mobility freedom writ large. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jordan Berninger from Trust Factors as well. Uh, regarding privacy and internet identity, do you see the online world uh, following and continuing or diverging from the recent court case uh, in the European Union? The right to forget one? Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of problems with the right to forget. It's a great philosophical concept, and I, I love it conceptually. But in practice, um, it misses a lot of really critical things about understanding how uh, our identity and our data is constructed. First, it assumes individual control, right? 
actually a lot of what goes on about who we are and what's said is, is very much networked. Not just what's said about you, but the way in which you are implicated by the people around you. Um, and so this is one of the weird things where I'm just like, okay, so we're now putting the onus on individuals to do this. The other big challenge for me, of course, is that we have this weird moment where we're saying, okay, people um, have the right to privacy except when they're public figures, but where's that line, right? Where's that public figure line? Is it when the Guardian writes an article about you, or is that not the line, right? And of course, the Guardian was asked to take down a huge number of articles about public figures that they had critiqued for their various um, business and political activities. Um, that battle, to me, is the, just the beginning of trying to figure this out. In terms of issues of identity and reputation, part of it is, is I think we need to start figuring out how to culturally shift the burden of how we deal with these reputation issues. And I say this because we keep putting the onus on the individual um, who is the data producer, rather than the onus on how people are interpreting or what they're doing with that data. And I'll give this through a concrete example. Um, early on in my research, early on in social network sites, college admissions officers um, started going to MySpace to look people up, right? They thought they were going to be more productive in figuring out who would be appropriate for their the universities. And so I received a phone call from an Ivy League admissions officer. They wanted to accept a young black man from South Central in Los Angeles, had written a beautiful college um, admissions essay about wanting to leave behind the gangs he had grown up with. So they went to his MySpace profile, where it was filled with gang insignia, stuff that was clearly identifying the fact that he was affiliated um, um, to, with, with um, a particular gang in, in um, LA. And so they called me up with this question, why would he lie to us when we can tell the truth online? Now I've spent a lot of time in that community, and I know darn well that affiliation ain't so simple. It's a real survival tactic. Your cousins are affiliated, your family's affiliated. You need to be affiliated for all sorts of structural reasons, and you perform that affiliation as a survival tactic. And what happens, of course, is that that context, that context of what it means to be a kid in the middle of South Central in a really gnarly gang-ridden environment is so different than what it means to be part of a posh Ivy League institution. And that the posh Ivy League institution doesn't recognize its power and status in interpreting this kid totally out of context. And I say this because we talk a lot about this ability to forget or this ability to think about identity when we think about the most privileged parts of the population, rather than the populations who are really not as privileged and having to know, negotiate fundamentally disconnected worlds. Worlds that demand things of their identity that put them at odds with one another. Worlds that make them have to navigate it. And we need to figure out how to create, put the burden on people to think about how they're interpreting people because otherwise we reposition them within that real significant dichotomy. And I think that we can do it. We can rethink about how we deal with interpreting things. I mean, think about it. Our last three presidents, I didn't inhale, I found God, and I was a kid, so get over it. That's our response to drugs over three cohorts, right? That's a really significant change in a set of values of how we make sense of it. So how do we take the, the responsibility whenever we're interpreting what's going on to go beyond it? And then I say, I'm not saying that we are good there, right? Our media, I'm gonna keep going back to you, Larry. Our media is not helping this at all, right? And it's taking things out of context and it's spinning. But I think that, you know, my struggle with the identity battles is that it's not going to be about whether or not we can get people to better lock down and own and possess and control. It's going to be about how we take responsibility for the interpretation. There's mics that are somewhere. Okay, and hands, acknowledge the mic people so they can see you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tom Bacholtz. The uh, question is, any thoughts about similarities and differences in the behaviors you've been discussing in our society with behaviors of people at any age in societies in which uh, governments suppress uh, interpersonal interaction or access to information, whether or not this is an internet-related thing or not. Yeah, I mean, you know, I made snarky comments about the fact that young people are starting to learn to be political dissidents, and it's uh, it's really true. I mean, one of the things I saw, you know, this was um, uh, early days of uh, uh, attempts to block and filter in various. Uh, you know, schools, right, all this sort of cat and mouse game with young people, um, and just amazing amounts of young people learning how to use proxies, right, it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting, what does it mean to learn to use proxies, and what does it mean to start going into those environments? So I'm going to take us on a funny tangent. We always have a group of young people and adults who are really resistant to whatever the norms or values of a society are. Um, not all young people rebel. Um, that's often a myth about it. But there are resistant and rebellious young people. Um, 
And I was really intrigued because I got to follow a chunk of them through a transition. Um, so I grew up um, as a hacker. Um, and I, we, my cohort spent a lot of time um, interrogating the, um, you know, the security state, um, mostly just to prove that we could, right? Just to prove that we were smarter than everybody else. That was part of the fun of the, you know, being um, a teenager at the time. Um, and so I was like, this is really fascinating. Of course, I put that behind as I moved on. But I went back and started looking at what hacking and that kind of resistant culture looks like and that kind of uh, political mobilization looks like. And of course, I ended up square in the middle of a site called 4chan. Um, if you don't know what 4chan is, do not look it up. I strongly recommend the Wikipedia entry. It is often referred to as the, underdog of the, or the underbelly of the internet. But the reason that this is important is that what I saw really quickly was that this group of young people were being trained to hack the attention economy, to mess with the kinds of information structures and who was playing it. So I'll give it through some funny examples that are pretty notorious um, for 4chan. Um, one was. Um, the frustra their frustration over the sexual predation conversation that was happening everywhere, and in particular, Oprah Winfrey's tendency to push on it. So they decided to see how far she would push on it. How absurd would she go? And they talked a lot about a character called Pedo Bear, um, which basically a glorified teddy bear with a very large phallus um, who is out to attack all children. And it was to be the moniker and, and representative of all predators everywhere. Um, so they basically created a networked environment about how Pedo Bear was coming in all really critical ways with the goal of getting um, uh, Oprah to talk about it live on national television. Sure enough, they succeeded. Um, they got uh, Oprah to talk and spend a whole session about how Pedo Bear was proof that the sexual predators were really real. They had a field day. Um, all right, that's sort of you know funny and juvenile and uh, not so surprising ways. Time Magazine creates um, a list of top 100 most influential people, like every other listicle out there, um, and they do it through a, a voting mechanism. Anybody could vote, right? So a bunch of 4chan came in, wrote a bunch of scripts, and put um, somebody they affiliate with by the name of Moot, um, which is the founder's nickname, and they put him at the top. And Time went. We're not that stupid. Like we can totally stop you from doing this. We're gonna make certain your scripts go away. None of this will happen. All right. So Time Magazine prints their 100 most influential. Very proud of having walked away from everything 4chan related, except that when they printed it, as always, they put them down so that the first letter of every first name lines up, and it read Marble Cake. Also, the game, a total in joke within the world of 4chan. All right, this is funny. This is hacking the attention economy. They had way too much fun with Rick Astley. Um, uh, for those who didn't follow Rick Rolling, that is something you should look up on YouTube. It's really entertaining. Um, but you know, all fun and games um, until WikiLeaks happens. Right? And all of a sudden, you have a bunch of kids who figured out how to organize and mobilize and to think in these resistant ways responding very loudly to their frustration over what's going on. And you see the rise of capital A Anonymous, which originally started out around a Scientology dynamic, comes into something at a much greater level um, in light of what was going on uh, with WikiLeaks and resistant and whatnot. And again, we can sit there and think, okay, that's really interesting. It started to get bigger and bigger until we start to think about Edward Snowden. Right? who is part of that same ecosystem, that same culture, and regardless of your particular interpretation of um, his actions, the very fact that he grew up in this environment of thinking about technology as a tool of resistance, a way of understanding things, is core to what he was trying to achieve. Right? And it's a really interesting moment to me because I'm seeing that kind of dynamic, and I would argue that um, this kind of technical mechanism is going to be a core aspect of civil disobedience. It will not be a mainstream thing. It will be something that happens at the edges. Um, but most people are growing up in an environment where they are constantly dealing with these systems, and their acts of resistance are political dissident resistance. Um, and more and more adults are, too. Um, and now part of it, of course, twists around when you think about the world of data. Um, a very good friend of mine, um, during her pregnancy, just after the Target um, story in the New York Times, decided she, to see if she could convince data brokers, or she could go for nine months without data brokers knowing that she was pregnant. She wanted to see what she'd do. And so she did all of these funny things, you know, just, I mean, the fact that she used Tor to look up Baby Center was highly entertaining to all of us, right? She was just using all of these tools that were available. Um, until she started actually triggering all of these notices, right? And she actually had to start suddenly dealing with law enforcement officers who figured she was probably engaging in something illegal, right? Simply because she was trying to opt out of that system. That kind of dynamic is part of where we're seeing these puzzles plays out. 
and the majority of the population won't be affected by it, but it's going to be intriguing to see how that plays out, especially since there's a lot of people who are learning these tools, just trying to get by with their parents. Where that might go? There Hi. it is. Hi, Dana. I'm Jessica Ware with Microsoft. Um, so, death. Death is a super logout. Death is maybe the ultimate logout. I'd like to copyright that phrase right now, since I just came up with it. Um, <laughs> What do you think about social media sites that outlive their original content producers? So say a teenage suicide, a victim of gang violence, the family comes in, controls the site, the friends turn into a memorial site. What happens um, to social media after the user's gone? Um, it is not an easy answer. There's actually some really great people working on it. Um, Jed Brubaker at Irvine is uh, the person who immediately comes to mind. Um, he's actually consulting with Facebook right now, trying to figure out how to deal with some of these issues. Um, and part of it, of course, is that you know when you build these systems, you just don't even imagine this user case. Not because you're you know you know an unthinking human being. You just it just doesn't cross your mind, right? Um, and so it's a really interesting challenge because we start to get this question of of possession, right? And you thought that like a regular splitting of objects was going to be fraught, right? Watch what happens when you start to split online materials and who gets ownership and control over it, especially in the more fraught um, deaths and, and and situations. You know. Do I have a really good answer to it? No. I'm not convinced so that property is the right frame, which is often how we get to it. It is much more about trying to think about a, a new way of, of dealing with it. The m best legal frame that I think of it is in terms of um, family, family law, which often thinks about what is in the best interests of the child, for example, in a divorce case. And it's because it's, we're not going to go with the Solomon's approach, right? Like, that child is not going to be split in half. That's just not what we're going to do. So how do you start to think about best interests of the child? So what do we start thinking about as the best interests of the deceased? Now, there's another switch to this, which I'm going to take you on a little tangent because I think it's important. It's not just about these digital artifacts. It's also about the other d um, data you leave behind. Let's just talk about DNA for a moment, right? Your DNA is not just your DNA. It is the DNA of all of your family members. So what does it mean when you leave behind or have uh, people have access to that material? And what does that say, not just about you, but all the people around you? I say this because there's an interesting court case that occurred last summer called Marilyn v. King, um, where the court ruled that collecting DNA at the point of arrest is equivalent to collecting a fingerprint or um, a photograph. And the assumption was it was a unique individual identity. Um, it was just about you. But that's not how this works. So the reason I say that is that DNA in some ways shows more cleanly the way in which we are all connected and our data connects us. We need that shift. We need to shift from a world in which we think it is about the individual or a property-driven model to a world in which we understand that this is all networked and that our ethics and responsibility for dealing with any of this stuff is about thinking about the actor or their data in light of this network. And that's a really significant shift, one that I would argue we can get there to. Now, for the more geeky in the room, Part of it is think about the radical shift between relational databases to a NoSQL style model. Right? That's a huge shift because we've actually reorganized how we construct information, and it's had radical ramifications in how we architect a lot of data-related systems. Right? We think about this in a more populist sense from our world and our language of talking about groups, um, you know, who's on your team or whatnot, to understanding that you live in a network, which is a lot of what social network sites did for the majority of people. Realizing that your friend group does not the same as your friend's friend group, right? There's overlap, but it's kind of different. But we don't have the language, we don't have the legal structures, we don't have the right frames to get there, which is part of what makes that so fraught. Go for it. Hi, Hi. I'm Steve from Automatic Labs. Um, I'm a parent, so I have a 10-year-old, and um, I see two moments coming up pretty soon where I'm going to have to have my parenting game on, like pretty tight. So one is getting a smartphone, the other is driving. And so I'm wondering what, what the bookends are. What do you think the bookends are? We've been talking a lot about teens, but where does it begin? Where does this uh, monitoring or surveillance really become a, start to become a real concern? Where does it end? Mm -hmm. And uh, are there moments in that spectrum that where we could use data to sort of bring some of that freedom back rather than take it away? Yeah. And then one last question is, should I buy Zoe a smartphone now? <laughs> Part of the challenge as a parent is that you're socializing your child just both into your values and your norms and expectations, but also cognizant of the fact that your child is exposed to a set of other values and norms based on his or her peers. 
When it comes to the latter question, the question in some ways is simple. Once 60% of her friends have it, right? Which is to say that once it becomes truly normalized within their peer group, you need to allow it, once, assuming that they're asking for it, which I'm assuming in this case, um, you have to you allow it because otherwise what you're doing is socially ostracizing your child from their peer group. Now, how you want to team up with the other parents to negotiate that 60% mark is your call, right? And that's where political mobilization occurs, and I strongly recommend involving your PTA. Um, but the, you know, the reason I say this is that we often assume that our choices are individual rather than the effects that they have within the broader peer groups. Now, Age is a really tricky one. Age is not so simple as saying like, oh, at this age, 13, you are magically capable of thinking. Like what? Right? Like why do we make these arbitrary age distinctions? A lot of the challenge as a parent is to figure out how you're transitioning your child and your your particular child, your other kids might be different, right? There's all of this variability to figure out the maturation processes. You also want to give them a certain amount of freedom let them test it and pull back if it's not working. It's a basically a social contract, right? Now, it, some people make it much more formal, but like you're really trying to navigate that around all of these issues. Now, there's a couple of other really critical things to set up at this stage and at this age. Right now, if your 10-year-old is like most 10-year-olds, they still really, really trust you and they turn to you for a variety of other things. That might not be true in a few years, just warning. Um, and so one of the things that you should do as you start to think about it is set up an entire network of other adults in your world that your daughter can turn to really significantly when things go wrong. Right? These are the aunts and the uncles and the cousins and you know the cool coaches and a variety of different actors that are in their world. The reason is at some point they're really going to want to complain about you. Um, and having that network of trusted adults is really important. The other thing is, is that those trusted adults can figure out when to report back something to you that's actually really significant. Right? They're not going to tell you that your daughter's been cursing, but they might tell you that something much more serious is up. That becomes really imperative in this process. And I say this because there's the other layer to it, which is that your kids' friends are really critical in this process. Right? And in some ways, I would argue, school choice should not actually really be about the educators. It should be about the network of other kids, because that's actually the most significant factor in all of this, which is to say, what kind of influence and what kinds of dynamics are going on? And how do you make certain that your daughter is in a point where she can actually look out to what's going on within her friend world and make certain that people are OK? Um, and I say this because more often than not, you know, when you have concerned, engaged parents, I'm not worried about their kids. But that isn't to say I'm not concerned about their, ki their kids' friends. Right? And there are things that happen in people's lives where things go really awry, right? Your, 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 your daughter's um, uh, friends, the parents are in a divorce, and she's a mess, right? And she's engaging in really you know, reactive behavior, and that's affecting the entire friend group. Um, and, or there's so much pressure in this other household that you start to see eating disorders or self-injury, and that's affecting the friend group. So part of it is you're also thinking holistically about how to support the friend group, the peer group, and be there as the parent that's concerned, and make certain that you're the cool parent for other people, even if you can't be cool for her. That's the tricky balance in all of it. All right, I get one more question, and then I'll stick around and chat. Sorry to do all of this to you, but you, you are the lucky winner. You're the final question. Great. My name is Diane Main. I'm with the Harker School in San Jose and a number of other ed tech related organizations. Um, I have to set up my question just a little bit. In the world of ed tech, we're doing a lot to try to um, help students establish their presence, and they're doing a ton of creating anyway online. We're trying to make that happen more in the school setting. There's a lot of pushback. Parents, uh, school administrations, school boards, whoever's you know, in charge of, of allowing us to let them have that presence uh, tend to, to put a lot of rules in the way. Yep. Do you know if anybody is either continuing your research, using your research, are you doing more with it to support the efforts of innovative educators who are trying to make sure that students have a chance to craft their own identity and also share the things they're creating online instead of it always having to be hidden? Yeah, no, I, I don't know people, other people that are doing it. I think what you've identified as part of you know, my deep frustration about what's happened in terms of how parents and educate, or parents and administrators, I should say, have responded to this within a school setting. In the earliest days of social media, I could rely on the fact that parents um, stayed out of it, and teachers who were really concerned about their students were really actively present online. Um, and they were often the cool teachers. I'll never forget um, a story actually out of Oakland here. Um, it was a teacher who, you know, this was MySpace, it was very early on. And he was, um, he was on MySpace because his friends were on MySpace. 
And then all of a sudden, the students were in MySpace, and he was like, ooh, this is gonna be ugly. Right, and he's of course stepping back, he's like, I'm not gonna friend them, but they all started friending him, and he was like, okay. So he decides to accept the friendships and just sort of see how this whole thing goes. And then one day, one of his students um, you know, jumps onto his profile and is like, writes, a, writes a, um, a comment and says, yo, Mr. C, why are we learning this whole trigonometry thing? I just don't get it. My parents don't know trig. they totally fine. Like, what gives? I don't understand why I'm learning this. It's like, okay. So he starts in and he says, you know, the reason you learn trig or read Shakespeare is not because of necessarily this content, you know, it's about in teaching you how to think. And he basically goes through a pedagogy lesson. And of course, all these other students start piling on and they start to have this conversation and it transforms his classroom. All of a sudden, the next day, they have had this really intense conversation on their turf, on their terms, about what they're doing in the classroom, and they're willing to pay much more attention to him. And it was a really phenomenal situation. I ran into counsel, countless um, young people for whom um, access to a teacher um, through a mediated technology was absolutely critical. Not just for identity development, but when, you know, when shit's gone awry and they need somebody to turn to, teachers are often a really critical um, ally in that. But of course, fear-mongering is really uh, paid a cost on educators who are really deeply engaged. And it's not just fear-mongering with regard to administrators and liability, but parenting hovering, right? Which is like, how dare you be the person that my child turns to instead of me? Um, and that's, particularly in more privileged schools, um, a huge problem. And I really worry about it because um, I think teachers are sort of in a, or educators in general, are in this really ugly push-pull fight. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know how to break through that. I really don't because for me it's just, it's political, full on. Um, and I'm amazed that anybody wants to go into the profession these days, right? And like, I, I mean, I need them, I love them, educators are critical, but oy, what a, you know, what a situation. Um, and so, I mean, I think that a lot of it really comes down to how we rethink, you know, what that relationship is. And that makes it such a harder and heavier burden than whether or not it's about the technology being allowed or not. Um, the cleanest ways that I've seen high school teachers do it um, is by uh, talking about LinkedIn profiles, making it safe and having nothing to do with the actual content of what they do everyday life, but you know, implicitly going through the conversation as they talk about the LinkedIn profile. Um, the other way in which I've seen educators do this is through um, asking questions, like critical questions, not critical as in cruel, but critical as in like curious in, in a productive sense. Um, and so trying to help people navigate what they're doing and getting them to reflect, right? This is the critical thinking skills that we hope to impart on young people. Um, I think about it a lot in terms of, um, uh, there's an old anthropologist named Jean Briggs, uh, and she used to write this beautiful, she wrote this beautiful book called Inuit Morality Play. And it was about how Inuit youth learn morality. Um, and it makes no sense in an American context at all. My favorite part of it is this whole story about how a lot of it is asking questions. Asking questions that force young people to think even at a young age. Right, so imagine that your child, um, yay, hi, comes up to you and is like, mommy, 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 I hate Bobby, he's mean, right? Um, and an American parent would immediately respond, it's okay, I love you, right? Like this kind of seemingly supportive and yet not necessarily helpful um, response to it. An Inuit parent would take a totally different approach, say, well, why don't you kill him? <laughs> you imagine, this is not something I recommend trying on the playground. Um, and of course, you know, your, your, your son will look back to you and goes, well, I don't hate him that much. Well, how much do you hate him? Which is not fair. Okay, well, what is fair? Right? Asking these questions at an age before they're like, mom, why are you asking questions? But like at an age where it's just like trying to get the thinking process going. Right? And it's a really interesting tactic that I recommend for both parents and educators as they're thinking about this. We all know that these technologies are being used in different ways than we as adults use them. Even if we are like the most sophisticated Twitter users out there, you look at teenagers' Twitter accounts and that is not the way you think about this at all. Right? So part of it is how do you ask the questions, not the condescending questions, not the judgmental questions, but the truly curious and yet provocative questions. You know, and I, I think about this, you know, in my own life, uh, my favorite moment of questioning ever um, was, you know, one of my more rebellious days um, where I decided I was going to shave my head. Great way of making uh, my mother really, really happy. And I go home, and of course, she's outraged, right? Like, how dare you? What are you trying to do? I don't care about your sexuality, blah, 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 blah. I was like, I got my wish, right? She's really outraged with me. This is awesome. My grandmother walks in the room, looks at me, goes, huh, wonder why you're trying to look like you were in the Holocaust, and walks off, right? <laughs> Whoa, nothing was more successful at making me go, 
what am I thinking about in my appearance? Right? That moment of asking this question, not in this really you know, intensive way, but just like, that's interesting. And, like, da, 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 da. and I think about that as I think about some of these um, encounters that people, the teachers have had in a really productive way of just like, huh, I saw that picture. Like, that's funny. Like, how should, what I thought about it. And you're like, whoa, that was not what I meant to portray at all. And that's how that beautiful identity work can go on. But it's hard, and it, it's buffered through those really political, political dynamics. So I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> on that note, thank you all. Um, thank you very much. Dana, that was really fun. Thank you. We could go on, I know, for a lot longer. So we're going to try to get you to come back and talk to us some more next year. So as a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. you. Wear that in good health. Thank you. Thanks again to Microsoft for hosting us. And you have been a wonderful audience. So thank you so much. And see you soon, I hope. Good night. Thank you.